Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure. And MR, thank you for the honor of being able to speak over here. I grew up in India, uh, came here to go to Carnegie Mellon, got a master's degree. Uh, and since then, I've started a few different companies that I've run in the US. And I've also angel funded maybe 35 or 40 companies in the US and India elsewhere. Through that, I've discovered kind of what it takes. I mean, I've had many companies survive, thrive. I've had many companies not make it, et cetera. So I've learned a few lessons on what it takes to scale up organizations, et cetera. Along the way, incidentally, I've also discovered that success is relative. The more success you have, the more relatives you discover. Okay. <laughs> so in India, uh, my wife and I have been involved in supporting various uh, NGOs in India in the healthcare space for the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, through these NGOs, uh, I've traveled to remote parts of India, uh, meeting with people you know, uh, with the health issues, et cetera. And some of these really stick in your mind. Uh, and I'll just relate briefly one, maybe two years ago, uh, two years ago, uh, one particular incident. I was in Rajasthan in a village out there, met with this very poor farming family, uh, husband and wife in their mid-30s, day laborers. They were working on farms, uh, and they were below the poverty line in India. Uh, and the wife in her mid-30s had started feeling intense backaches, wasn't able to, or had to urinate frequently, couldn't sleep well, was getting more and more fatigued every day. So she wasn't able to work on the farm. So she went, and there's, of course, no government health clinic nearby. So she goes to the local Ayurvedic doctor. He prescribed some pills, took those for a few weeks. They didn't work. Then she went to the local uh, ASHA worker, which is the frontline healthcare worker in India, prescribed some more pills. Those didn't work. ASHA worker says, well, now you need to go to your government health center, uh, which is you know five miles away. Husband and wife take the day off, lose their wages, go to the primary health center, no doctor there. Come back, lost the day's wages. Go back a month later, no doctor there. Come back. And this, by the way, is true in India. The doctors are there maybe a quarter of the time in these primary health care centers. Finally, after two or three months and after having lost several days of wages for both the husband and wife, uh, she meets the doctor. Doctor says, you may have diabetes, but we won't know until you go to the district hospital, to the lab, get a test done. Poor lady says, how much will it cost? He says, 350 rupees. And by the way, you'll need medicines on top of that. So after that, the husband and wife left, and they went right back to their village. They didn't have the money for the test, 350 rupees. They couldn't afford the time to go to the district hospital. And the net result was that she completely stopped working. She couldn't work anymore. So that family, just the bottom line was, a family that was already poor, by Indian standards, which means really down here, was now thrust into even more abject poverty. And from that, there's no way out. Right? That's the bottom line. Fast forward maybe a year. So this was around a year ago. I was in Delhi. And I met with three young engineering students who had developed this really interesting medical device, which they had tested, had been certified, which basically was a blood glucose analysis instrument, uh, which did this diabetes test. And it cut the cost down of that test from 350 rupees to 5 rupees. 350 rupees to 5 rupees. It was IT enabled. You could transmit the test results to a remote doctor, et cetera, et cetera. But they hadn't been able to get any funding. Because in India, even though there's a lot of money going into you know, angel money and venture capital, but for social entrepreneurs who are really small, who need $50,000, $100,000, that money isn't there. It's very tough, because they really don't have any commercial business models. But I was thinking, gee, if someone would fund these guys, you know, think of the difference we could make. And of course, in India, as we all know, there are thousands of innovators like this, right? Who, in healthcare, in education, in agriculture, et cetera, who've got brilliant ideas, but don't have the money, don't have the management technical know-how, they're working with two people in a small village in UP. There's someone else working on the same thing in three villages in Tamil Nadu. They don't know what each other is doing, and basically they don't have resources. right? But there are thousands of them. So here's my plan. So to me, you're doing five fairly simple things. I think we can transform healthcare in India. right? And it's very practical, very down to earth. Number one. Out of these thousands of innovators in healthcare in India, let's start by identifying the 400 or 500 that are the most promising. Okay? 
uh, that are the most promising in terms of the impact their innovations can have, that are the most promising in terms of the scalability of their ideas, because lots of ideas sound good but really aren't that scalable, uh, and, that are, and that whose ideas could also be sustainable. Impact, scalability, sustainability. Let's find the most promising four or 500. So that's step number one. And then let's give them the support that they need to scale up. Number two, scaling up requires money. Let's face it, with all the know-how and all the stuff, you need money. So the second part of the plan is let's develop over the next few years a $100 to $200 million social venture fund, India's healthcare innovation fund, to support these four or 500 innovators. Average of 100,000 to a half million dollars each. Like I said, that money is not available in India. So that's number two. Step three, and this is the part that's really different, and most NGOs don't do in India. Part three, to be effective in healthcare in India, to get scale, my belief is one has to work with government, right? Most NGOs in India refuse to work with governments because they're corrupt, they're bureaucratic, this, that. They are. They are corrupt, they are bureaucratic. But at the end of the day, to get scale, to achieve something on a large scale, the government programs, especially in healthcare, are the ones that actually reach out to the villages, to the hundreds of millions. And without that, for any of us to think we can do anything on scale is totally impossible. And of course, healthcare in India is a state government issue. It's not a union government issue. All the implementation is done by the state government. So my thinking in step three of this program is the following. Let's focus on the five big low-income states of India, right? Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Orissa, Bihar, and Uttar Pradesh. It's maybe 30% of India's population, but it is 90% of India's challenges on any front that you look at, whether it's water, electricity, education, healthcare, et cetera, 80 or 90% of India's challenges are in these states. It's not like other states are perfect, South India, West India, but the other states are progressing. But these states really are a mess. So, point three of the plan, Let's set up partnerships with the state governments of these four or five states. Let's work with them. And let's work with them in one specific area, which is strengthening their primary healthcare system. That is where the poor people of India interact with the healthcare system of India. Uh, and those systems are really broken in these states. If you're a villager in a remote area in Rajasthan or Madhya Pradesh or Orissa, if someone has a health problem in your family, you're basically screwed. That example I gave you of Parvati Devi, you know, whose family was already poor and went even further into poverty, you know how often that happens in India? Every year in India, 39 million families go into poverty because of healthcare costs. 39 million families a year. Is that not tragic? Right? So we have to address this. So part three of the plan, work with the state governments and work on transforming the primary healthcare system. That's the foundation of healthcare and do it using these innovators and these innovations that we found through the first two steps. Step four, all of these innovators, as I said, there's some very good ones all over India, but they're tiny, they're fragmented, you know, like I said. If, so any area you pick, let's say infant nutrition, which is a big problem in these states, right? There are probably, you know, hundreds of innovators working on, innov on uh, infant nutrition. You know, again, one in UP and three in Bihar, et cetera, et cetera but they are isolated, they don't know how to connect, how to collaborate, et cetera. So the fourth point of my plan, is let's develop a large-scale national ecosystem in India for ongoing healthcare innovation. Variety of ways, and of course, Silicon Valley is the expert at how to do this, right? And the US, you know, help these people connect, collaborate, conferences, you know, websites where they can do things together, connect them with venture capitalists, with philanthropists, government people, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the fourth part of the plan, develop this national <laughs> ecosystem for large-scale ongoing healthcare innovation. And the fifth and final part of the plan is develop a knowledge hub so that we all know and everyone knows which of these interventions are working better than others. Like I said, any area that you pick, diarrhea management, right? Diarrhea is the single biggest killer of infants in developing countries, right? Now. If you look at innovators in diarrhea management, there are probably hundreds just in India, all trying slightly different approaches. And if you're an investor or philanthropist, or you're a state government, uh, you know, health secretary, and you want to do so, which of these do you use? There is nothing out there that tells you that this particular approach being tried is better than this, and why, et cetera. So we need to develop, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the fifth part, is develop a knowledge hub 
that shows which of these interventions is working and why. What are the contextual factors? Which ones are not working and why not? What are those contextual factors? So that then you've got a framework for people to make intelligent decisions and know which of these to back going forward, right? So that's the five points of the plan. So with this in mind, and as I was thinking all of this through a year ago, my wife and I uh, started a foundation in India a year ago called the Wish Foundation, Padwani Initiative for Sustainable Healthcare. Uh, and we said, let's put this into action. So we started about a year ago, we teamed up with the World Bank. And the first thing we said was, let's see what's happening in the healthcare innovation landscape. No one had done this before. So we found out who are the innovators. We identified thousands of innovators in, in healthcare, et cetera. We said, let's assess them for who's doing what. And we narrowed down to a list of about 170 of the most promising innovators in healthcare. And in fact, you can go to our website and take a look at this whole list, and there's a description of what each person is doing and so on. So we did that. Uh, and from those 170, we've narrowed down to about 15 that my foundation has started working with, giving them grant money, giving them management, technical support, helping them scale up, et cetera. Secondly, on the developing this large social venture fund, we're just in the early stages of organizing the fund. Uh, Nishit Bhai from here, Nishit Desai is helping doing all the legal structuring and so on. And I'm hopeful that over the next eight, 12 months, we will have raised the first 20, 30, 40 million dollars of that. So we can start giving equity and debt money to these people. The third part, partnering with state governments, and again, like I said, these five states are the focal points. Uh, we decided first to approach the state of Rajasthan. Uh, the state of Rajasthan, again, very poor, very rural, lots of challenges. Healthcare indicators are some of the worst in the country. But the state government right now seems to be very focused on truly trying to improve things. Uh, the uh, state chief minister, as you know, Vasundhara Rajay, very dynamic lady, very progressive, and again, very focused on improving things. So my team uh, in Delhi, the Wish Foundation team, we, before going to her or before going to anyone, we said, let's take a hard look at the state. Let's see what they need. And we did about three months of analysis, district by district. There's about 35 districts in Rajasthan. Exactly what the needs are in each uh, district, what the gaps are. Developed a plan and then went to the principal health secretary in Rajasthan and said, look, we, here's some thinking that we have. Here's what we could do uh, to improve things. And, and our real focus, like I said, is primary health care. And within primary healthcare, it's reducing infant and maternal mortality, which is a huge, huge problem in these states. Surprisingly, the principal health secretary really liked the plan. He said, well, let me take you to the health minister in the state. He loved the plan. He said, let me take you to the chief minister. She loved the plan. Uh, so net-net, we formed a partnership with the state of Rajasthan two months ago. Uh, and what's happening now is in this month, in the month of May, uh, uh, as we, uh, that we're in right now, the state of Rajasthan is turning over 220 of their worst performing healthcare centers in the state over to us, over to my foundation. We're going to run these 220 healthcare centers moving forward. We have a very detailed plan on what we'll do in these. 12 very specific areas that we're focusing on, diarrhea management, uh, uh, infant nutrition, uh, et cetera. A very specific metrics that we are tracking. Telemedicine is a big part of what we're doing because there's a huge shortage of doctors in these remote areas. And the, what the Rajasthan government has committed is the following. They're saying every six months, show us your results. If you're performing and you are achieving these metrics, we will turn over more and more of our clinics over to you. And by the way, this is the first time in the history of Rajasthan that they've ever turned anything over to the private sector, to the NGO sector. They had to pass a special act in, in the local legislature to make this happen. More importantly, what they've committed to is that as we show results in these 220 centers we're managing, they will roll out, the government will roll out these interventions into their 10,000 clinics that the government manages across the state. That's where you start getting scale, right? Uh, so that work is just starting my team. I've got about 25 people working in our foundation in India. They are scrambling now, it's 24 seven, you know, to, to roll all this out. Uh, interestingly, we have just gotten approached by the government of Madhya Pradesh and the government of Odisha about starting a similar program there. We've told them, give us three or four months, let Rajasthan stabilize a little bit, and then hopefully we'll start doing something there. Uh, on the ecosystem side, we've started organizing uh, conferences, summits in India. We had India's first healthcare innovation summit in Delhi in uh, November of last year. Uh, we had uh, a similar summit in Jaipur in Rajasthan about two months ago. Uh, we've started organizing uh, challenge, uh, uh, grand challenges and you know, healthcare rewards in India for uh, people in innovation. Uh, and we are on the early stages of building this knowledge hub. 
So I just think forward. You know, this Lady Parvati Devi that I mentioned in the middle, I just think that, you know, the, the goal, the hope, the aspiration is, were that to happen two or three years from now? Just think of what a different outcome we could have. You know, at that stage, these three young engineers with this blood glucose meter would have developed this device. And by the way, we are funding them right now. This device is being developed and is being tested. The state would have taken this on and would have trained up their frontline ASHA workers on how to use these devices. So when a Parvati Devi gets these backaches and this urination problem and fatigue, et cetera, she goes to a healthcare worker. The healthcare worker knows what to do. She's uh, diagnosed with diabetes. And now that diabetes can be managed and she can live a normal life. Not a great life, still poor, but at least not thrust even worse. So that's the kind of potential we can have. There are 800 million people like this in India, less than $2 a day, most of them rural. There are 450 million people in India with less than a dollar a day of income who need this kind of help. And the great thing is, now is the time. People in India, we all know this, they are hungry for change. They are demanding change. The atmosphere is conducive. State governments more than ever before really want to try and make good things happen. And now it's up to us, all of us, to kind of step in to do what we can. Thank you very much for letting me know.